is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You and a friend are looking for a place to live. You have a list of places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. The rental on 3rd Street has three bedrooms. So in the example, three bedrooms has been written down in the number of rooms column for 19 3rd Street. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well, then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list. Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK. Well, maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now, there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear the director of the Leadership Council give his welcome address at a convention. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Please find your seats. Snacks will be available all day long. Thank you. Allow me to first introduce myself. I am Joe Steinke, Director of the Leadership Council. On behalf of the Organizing Committee for the 8th Annual Leadership Conference, I welcome you all to San Dimas, California, for a special session on postmodern solutions. We have people attending from as far away as Toronto, New York, and even the Bahamas. Frankly, I wish we had gone to you there. <laughs> but we're very glad you're all here. Let me say further that this will be our largest conference yet. Registrations have far surpassed our expectations. For the first three days, we will be hosting more than 325 participants for lectures and workshops. Another 100 will be joining us for our final two days and culminating session on Friday evening. We also have a larger selection of seminars than ever, a total of 32. Because we know that you all will want to attend a few special sessions, we will repeat key seminars each day. So there will actually be 38 sessions. I'm sure you will all be pleased with the content and the quality of speakers. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, for those who have opted not to take part in our bag lunches, there are a number of places nearby that we can recommend. We are located here in the convention center just across the street from the Harford Shopping Mall, and the place we most recommend is Vital's, which is just west across Queen Street on the opposite corner. Please be careful crossing both streets, however, as we don't want to lose any participants. <laughs> if you're not up to Vital's, you can also get some Italian food at the Olive Garden, which is further down Queen Street and east on Danning Avenue, across from the police station. They have a great minestrone soup and excellent breadsticks, all you can eat. On the other hand, if you want some good old American food, you can head to Fuddruckers for some big hamburgers or to the Cattle Company for some fat, juicy steak. Fuddruckers is next to the Olive Garden, but the Cattle Company is back closer to us in the opposite direction of Vital's. Just go east out of the convention center across King Street. It's on the same side as the convention center, so you just have one street to cross. Enjoy. But also, please make sure you are back for the afternoon sessions. These will always start at 1.30 p.m. That will give you an hour and a half for lunch each day. Sessions will be over each day at 5.30. Now, regarding the schedules we've printed out, there have been a couple of last-minute changes. The session titled New Leadership Strategies will no longer be held in Seminar Room 1, but in the main ballroom. This session has garnered much praise and is highly recommended to all, hence the change to a larger room. Another session has been canceled. That session was titled Leading by Serving, and it was scheduled for Daniel's room. The speaker for that session, Dr. Mark Green, had to return home for some urgent health situation. We wish the best to Dr. Green and that all is fine with his family. Finally, the session titled Using the Arts and Media has been changed to the second lounge room, Lounge 2. Please show up promptly for sessions and sit towards the front of each room so that all seats can be utilized. Also, turn off all pagers, beepers, and cell phones. Drinks and snacks will be provided outside each room, but please be careful at your tables. Enjoy the conference. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Peter Walsh being interviewed for a job. Listen and choose the correct answer for each question. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Joanne! Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin, and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well... Where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end, B1, 
because it's right up at the northern end of Australia, and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney. So you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia. Probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realize until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art, music, dancing, and so on are concerned, because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theater and opera in the same way as cities down in the south, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves. Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artist groups and writers groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international. Yeah. They say there are over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but mm, when a very bad storm, uh, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious center today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see the places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year, it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles, too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And answer the questions. Please sit down, Mr. Walsh. My name's Jane Swain, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to chat about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Weston's? It is Weston's, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I am not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2005. Is that right? Yes, 2005. Then I was unemployed for about three months. And then I traveled around America for a few months. So, yes... It must be about three years now, in fact. Hmm, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change jobs? 
I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting and stimulating. The salary's okay, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted, so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh, my dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. The other people are great. There's a good cooperative atmosphere. I mean, among the staff, and compared to other companies, the conditions are great. I mean, the office itself and the working conditions. Hmm. And then there's the fact that they give me lots of room for initiative and let me make decisions. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. Yes, well, we're looking for someone like that. You know, someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. And what about your education? You went to Manchester University, didn't you?、Uh, yes. After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design, but I decided to give it up and did an arts degree at university instead. Good. And have you done any courses since? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a teacher talking about several British art galleries. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first class of V100 Art and History. The objectives of the course, as you will have seen if you've taken a look at the syllabus, include familiarizing yourselves with the vocabulary and language of art. Learning about the basic elements of art and design, and finally, discussing historical periods as they pertain to art. The course will also give you the opportunity to visit some of the many galleries and museums that Britain has to offer. So, having said that, I'd like to spend the rest of today's class talking about four of the more important galleries that we will be visiting in the coming year. As most of you already know, or at least I hope most of you know, there are four Tate galleries in all. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Tate Modern. Tate Modern is located in a very busy part of London called the South Bank. It's close to two world-renowned tourist attractions: St Paul's Cathedral and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Now, interestingly enough, Tate Modern is housed in what was a power station, built in several stages between 1947 and 1963. It was closed down in 1981 and reopened as a gallery in the year 2000. Tate Modern consists of five levels, with the Tate Collection being shown on the third and fifth levels. On level two, the works of contemporary artists are exhibited, while level four is used for holding large temporary exhibitions. 
Since this museum opened, it has become a popular spot for both Londoners and tourists alike. And believe it or not, it doesn't cost anything to get in to see the collection displays. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Now, the second gallery I'd like to talk about is Tate St. Ives, which is in Cornwall. It was built on the site of a gas works, and it overlooks Porthmeor Beach. Tate St. Ives is housed in a three-story building that was designed by the architects Evans and Shalliff. It was established in 1993, seven years before Tate Modern was opened, and the gallery exhibits the works of modern British artists, including members of the St. Ives School, a group of artists living and working in the area from the 30s onwards. In later lectures, we'll be looking at the work of some of the artists who belong to that group and the ways in which they influenced each other. Okay, am I going too fast for any of you? No? Good. Next, I want to talk about Tate Britain, which is a gorgeous gallery situated right in the heart of Westminster. Tate Britain was the first of the four Tate galleries to open, and it was established in 1897. It was built on the site of an old prison, and when it first opened its doors, it was called the National Gallery of British Art. Later, it became known as the Tate Gallery, after the man who founded it, Sir Henry Tate. During its lifetime, Tate Britain has been damaged twice, once by floodwaters from the River Thames, and once by bombings during World War II. This gallery has an interesting range of exhibitions of historic and modern art from 1500 up to the present day. Now, the last gallery I'd like to tell you about is called Tate Liverpool. It's not hard to figure out where this gallery is located, is it? It was opened in 1988 to exhibit displays from the Tate Collection and it also has a program of temporary exhibitions. Tate Liverpool is housed in what was once a warehouse, and for some years it was one of the biggest galleries of modern and contemporary art in the UK. Well, that's a brief overview of just a few of the galleries we'll be visiting. I'd like now to look in a little more detail at what you can expect to see in each of these galleries, starting with Tate Britain. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thanks for watching. Here are other two videos. You can watch them as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed my channel, please subscribe it and hit the bell icon for my upcoming videos and share these all videos among your friends.